Hey YouTube, a lot of you guys are trying to get into data science. It is certainly a hot career. So I want to present to you this free data science for beginners course. I hope you enjoy it. So the way that I think about data science is first of all, that it's a process. It's not one thing. It's a bunch of steps that you have to do. So we want to understand the world. So often the first thing that we do, the first step, if you will, is we have a hypothesis of a problem. We think, oh, this could be the reason that our store sales have gone down. And then you take more steps to try to validate or invalidate that hypothesis with the data that you have. So really think about data science as about uncovering insights and trends that are hiding in your data. It's also important to realize that data science is indeed interdisciplinary. So yes, data science does use many techniques from statistics, but it's not just statistics. So there's computer science, there's information science, there's mathematics, especially as you move on in your data science journey. For example, when it comes to deep learning, a lot of calculus and linear algebra is involved if you really truly want to understand it. But in any case, if you have a business and you're interested in using data that you have and you're interested in working with it, manipulating it, exploring it to find insights, you are doing data science. So data science has become relevant because we have tons of data available today that we didn't have, let's say, especially before the internet information age, information technology age, if you will. In the past, we didn't have algorithms. Now we have algorithms. In the past, you had a situation that software was very expensive. Now it's open source and free. We couldn't store large amounts of data in the past. Now it's a fraction of the costs. We have more tools to work with. As mentioned, obviously more availability of data as well. And the ability to store and analyze that data. It's all cheap, it's all available. So this is a terrific time to become a data scientist. So what do data scientists actually produce in the real world? Well, that all depends on what you want them to do for you. In one situation, you might be asking for insights into the kind of problems on which they can help or an analysis based on data. You'll get a report or presentation expressed in plain business language that all stakeholders can understand. In many other cases, though, they're going to produce actual code. This can come in the form of a prototype and demo that developers later roll up into the main product or production quality code that they write and deliver directly into the product. Remember that ultimately data science is about discovering optimal solutions to existing problems. As an example, in the transportation industry, Uber collects real-time user data to discover how many drivers are available if more are needed, and if they should allow a surge charge to attract more drivers. Also in transportation, it is common to try to figure out how to create better traffic flow on the streets. Congestion on specific routes, especially during peak hours, is a problem for many transportation companies. Can you help solve this problem? Finally, there are many issues in our environment and data science also plays a big role here. You might be able to join a company that detects, collects, and makes sense of data that has to do with bacteria that is finding its way into the lakes. By getting the requisite skills, you can be part of these projects and many more as a data scientist. So you might have heard the term big data. 
Big data traditionally refers to the three big V's, volume, velocity, and variety. Because the business world has become more information and data driven than ever before, there is a large volume of data. At some point in time then, it may become impossible for you to store and process the data with the traditional methods that you've used. Another problem is the velocity of data. In part because of the volume of data coming in and the variety of data coming in, and especially for businesses that need to process data in a timely manner to know what to do about it, velocity is also a challenge to many businesses. Finally, variety. Data these days comes in all types of formats, from structured data, numeric data, let's say, in traditional databases, to unstructured text documents, emails, videos, audios, the stock ticker data, and financial transactions. In addition, some experts consider two additional big data terms. The first is variability, and this is the fact that for some businesses, data flows are unpredictable. They change often and very greatly. So an example of this would be a seasonal business. Finally, there's veracity. And veracity simply refers to the quality of data. Not all data is equal. So data that comes from different sources makes it difficult to link, match, cleanse, and transform data across systems. Without a business knowing how to connect and correlate relationships between the different data sources and figure out how this data is truly linked, it's not very high quality data. So let's talk about data mining. Data mining is one of the more common and popular processes of working with data. Specifically, the point of data mining is to discover patterns. Now, some people think data mining is mainly about the extraction of information, and hey, it is in the name, so fair play. But it's much more about figuring out these interesting patterns, unusual patterns, interesting relationships in data. While extraction, transformation, and loading of data, otherwise known as ETL, is part of the data mining process, the main purpose is to find patterns in the data. Often, the findings with data mining get used in later analysis. For example, when you do machine learning or predictive analytics. Now, there are three main different kinds of ways of finding patterns in data. The first way is called cluster analysis. With cluster analysis, you're looking at how different data records group together. As an example, many companies use cluster analysis to do what's called customer segmentation. They might segment based on demographics, based on customer situation, based on customer behavior, psychology, geography. These are all valid and it all depends what kind of data you're keeping on your customers. Maybe you focus on grouping by age or by family size, maybe based on the behavior of the customers, the people that spend a lot versus those that spend little. Maybe you do it based on situation. Maybe people have told you that the major reason why they purchase online is because of convenience. So that's a category. A second type of data mining is called anomaly detection. Here, you're trying to find unusual or rare patterns. Now, one of the most prominent use cases for anomaly detection is fraud detection in transactions. So banks love to use this to be able to tell if your credit card number or related information has potentially been compromised. 
So you can imagine using a combination of variables and saying, if this person did this and this and this and this, this would not be in line with what they usually do. So let's flag this. The final type of data mining is about finding dependencies. There's two different methods here used. One is called association rule mining and another is called sequential pattern mining. As an example, when it comes to association rule learning, supermarkets often use their transaction data to try to find associations between different products that a customer buys. They might see an association, a high association, between, let's say, a person buying beer and also potato chips. So let's say they find that 80% of customers, when they buy beer, also buy potato chips. This would then potentially impact how you price your products and also how you place them. Maybe it makes sense to put things that are commonly bought together right beside each other or very close to each other or something like that. So I hope that gives you some idea of how data mining works and how you would be able to help out a potential business. Now, one thing that happens in data science is that many terms or concepts are used interchangeably. This is very true for machine learning and deep learning. So let's go over the difference between machine learning and deep learning. So first, a simple definition for machine learning. So machine learning is a subset of AI, which is artificial intelligence, that uses computer algorithms to analyze data and make intelligent decisions based on what is learned without being explicitly programmed. On the other hand, deep learning is a specialized subset of machine learning that uses layered neural networks to simulate human decision making. So first, it's useful to know that artificial intelligence, which machine learning and deep learning both are, is an attempt by human beings to make machines have human intelligence. Now, it's important to realize that AI pioneers imagined a world where computers would possess essentially the same characteristics of human intelligence. For example, there was a vision that computers would be able to, at some point, be able to reason and have the same senses as humans do. Now, we haven't quite gotten to that point yet. And really, there's a good question. A good question can be asked, that is, if we will ever get there. But where we have gotten so far in this journey is what's referred to as narrow AI. So narrow AI is when a computer or a technology is able to perform specific tasks as well as or better than we humans can. So for example, when we make an AI classify an image, that's an example of narrow AI because it's doing a very specific tasks. It can figure out what an image is. Is it a dog? Is it a cat? And so forth. But it can go to the level of being able to reason about things and so forth. So having said that, understand then that machine learning is an approach to achieving artificial intelligence. At its most basic, it's just the idea of using algorithms to parse data, learn from it, and then make a determination or prediction about something in the world. Deep learning, on the other hand, is also machine learning because it's a subset of machine learning, but the difference is that it's a different kind of technique. So deep learning is inspired by neural networks and neural networks are inspired by our understanding of the biology of our brains. So all those interconnections between the neurons. But neural networks had not been all that popular or respected until about six to eight years ago. 
The big breakthrough was to realize that these networks had to be much deeper. So we needed a huge increase in the amount of layers and the amount of neurons. And we also needed more amounts of data so that the system can learn from those massive amounts of data to get trained. So this is where the deep in deep learning comes from. It describes all the layers in the neural networks. All right, so I wanna give some advice to those of you aspiring to get into data science. So the first skill or trait that you really need to have is to not be all that judgmental don't prejudge a situation. So if you come into a situation, somebody describes a problem to you, you might wanna get right into looking at the data that they have for you, but you don't wanna do that because you are going to get impacted by seeing the data. So one of the things that you do is the person talks to you about the problem and you start already jotting down what problems you think there might be. So then you're gonna have a chance to actually compare and see if that stuff that you thought might be a problem are actually problems when you actually see the data. Now it might be true that you don't have a specific variable to work with that you thought maybe you did because you didn't have a chance to see the data set ahead of time but this is a good way of not prejudging. It really, you get to see also your ability uh, to think about problems without having the data in front of you to begin with. Second, it's really important to be curious. So you gotta have curiosity. You have to be interested in what the problems are. You have to be interested in the processes, how businesses do things, why they do things, what have they tried before, all of these kinds of questions. So curiosity, a lot of it is about just willing to do the work and being interested uh, in the business, in the problems, and asking different questions that could help you uh, in the process. Next, you need to be a good communicator. The biggest thing about being a good communicator is directly saying exactly what you mean. A lot of people are sort of stuck in their head. There's a lot of things going on in their head. And as a result of that, they have a really tough time just coming out and saying exactly what they mean. So being direct is a really important aspect of good communication. Sometimes people try to be too fancy with what they're saying. They're giving a bit too much background that's kind of not useful. It's just gonna confuse all the people that you're working with. So sometimes you just need to kind of think, what exactly am I trying to say? What is the main base of what I'm trying to say? And just say it uh, directly. Another bit of advice when it comes to what you need to learn is, or be good with is, learn a lot of different technologies and techniques. So you're gonna learn different statistical techniques, you're gonna learn uh, different programming languages. Python is the big one right now. R and SAS are also very, very important programming languages to know. You'll also wanna learn different visualization tools, whether that's something like Plotly or Tableau, Power BI, and so forth. And finally, once you've done all the work, the most important thing is the ability to tell a story. So the big thing here, the advice here is work for a company in an industry, in an area, in a field that you're really passionate about. So are you passionate about finance? Are you passionate about healthcare? Because all of that information is that you've arrived at, all the results, all the outcomes, are only so useful unless you really get people's interests and really paint a compelling story about what you've found. What's the advantage of utilizing your findings? How are you gonna present these? So to do all of these things, you have to be passionate about, 
passionate about the field that you're in. So for me, it's healthcare and it's mental health, especially that I'm interested in. So keep these things in mind and you're going to be a great data scientist. Without a doubt, one of the more common questions when people are starting out in data science is what programming language should I learn? I'm going to be covering the four of the most important languages to learn. Those are Python, SAS, R, and SQL. Of course, there's other languages, but I would say those are less important and have more particular use cases. So maybe Java, C++, JavaScript, Ruby, Visual Basic. Again, they have their use cases, but generally I'm going to focus on the four that I mentioned. Ultimately, you should choose a programming language that's going to help you solve the particular problems that you're going to be working on. It's also going to depend on the company you work for, because the company you work for is obviously going to impact the type of problems that you're working on, the type of things you're going to need to accomplish, and of course, the role that you have. I'm going to be talking about some of the different roles in just a second. But I would also add that it's somewhat important what country you're in. For example, if you're in the United States, India, and Brazil, I would say that if you're going to learn three languages, and you should do that, I think everybody should know multiple programming languages, SAS should be one of those. If you're not in the US, India, or Brazil, learning SAS will probably be way less important and maybe you should do Python, R and something else. As mentioned, the role that you have at a company is also going to influence the programming languages that you should learn. So are you going to be the data scientist or the data analyst or the business analyst, the database engineer, the data engineer, the research scientist, the software engineer, the statistician, the project manager? All of this is going to also influence which language you should learn. So in the next few videos, I'm going to go over the four languages that I mentioned at the top of the video, Python, SAS, R, and SQL. All right, great. So thinking back to the intro to this section, I mentioned that one of the ways that you figure out which programming language you should learn is to consider what type of problems you're going to be interested in solving. So one of the great things about Python is that it provides tools that are suited for many different tasks or problems. So let's say that right now, and this is totally common, you're not really sure what kind of problems you're going to be interested in solving the most, or maybe later on it changes. The safest decision then is to go with Python because you could do things like web scraping, text processing, image processing, machine learning, deep learning, data analytics. So again, it has all these tools that are suited to doing all these different kinds of tasks. So if you're not sure or you still want to explore, it's best to start with Python. And not to forget, we've worked a little bit with NLP or natural language processing. You can use something called the Natural Language Toolkit or NLTK to do natural language processing inside of Python. Another thing to consider is that if you look at different surveys about what programming language different data professionals use, between about 70-75% to anywhere up to 85% use Python. And if you look at the different job postings, let's say from Glassdoor, you'll see about 70 to 80 percent of data science positions want you to know Python. The final thing I would mention is that Python has really clear and readable syntax. This is helped by the fact that indentation is an important aspect of Python programming, while it's not that important at all in a language like SAS. The other cool thing is that Python is not a very verbose language. You can do more with less code. So the focus is on what you're doing more than the language itself. 
All right, so let's talk about the SAS programming language. The first thing that you should know is that I've been teaching SAS programming for many years. Chances are, if you don't already work for a company that uses SAS, you might have not heard of it, or you might have heard of it, but never really used it. This is common. Where SAS really shines, and where they have about 30% market share, is advanced analytics. Advanced analytics would be things like predictive analytics, where you employ predictive models using statistical and machine learning techniques, and also prescriptive analytics, which recommends decisions using things like optimization, simulation, and so forth. There are two other types of analytics, decision analytics and descriptive analytics. All these four types of analytics I've mentioned fall under something called business analysis or business analytics. So the reason that SAS Institute do well in data analytics, especially advanced analytics, is that they've always been very receptive to large companies because large companies have very particular problems. So the first challenge is just the amount of data that they have to deal with. We're talking about volume, we're talking about velocity, we're talking about variety, all those things that I mentioned when we discussed big data. The other problem is that a large company has so many different parts to it. It has e-commerce, it has human resources, accounting, production, sales, customer service, and so forth. So all of this has to be integrated in some way. So then what SAS does for these huge companies is they give them these different easy to use technologies or software for data mining, for forecasting, for statistical analysis, for text analytics, for optimization and simulation, essentially for everything that a company would need. They'll, for example, include industry specific algorithms you'll be able to drag and drop to make certain models. So they make it really easy or much easier for these large companies who have these very particular issues. So if you're in particular interested in business analysis, being a business analyst, you should learn SAS because while the software that SAS does make available is very user friendly, it's largely drag and drop, if you want to be able to implement more flexible solutions, you should know how to program. And finally, I have to say SAS is super easy to learn, more easier for sure than Python or R. It's also slightly different in terms of coding than Python and R. So it might not be intuitive right away the first hour or two, but after that you'll realize that it's actually quite a lot easier. You just essentially have to understand the two different kinds of ways that you process data in SAS, data step processing and proc step processing. And once you get that, it's really quite easy. All right, so let's talk about the R programming language, also very popular. It's especially popular in academia, often used by statisticians, mathematicians, and data miners for developing statistical software, graphing, and also data analysis. And just like Python, the great thing about R is that the full range of its capabilities are available free of charge. So often the difference between people using Python or R is just where they're working. So in academia, a lot of people use R. In much of the business world, many people use Python. So this is different than SAS because yes, as a student, you can learn SAS programming for free using something like SAS Studio, SAS On Demand. These are two different names for essentially the same software that works on the cloud. But if you want access to a lot of the different software or technology from SAS, you would have to pay for that. And it's actually quite expensive and it tends to be sold in bulk to enterprises. So really, really large companies. Now, one complaint that I would have had some years ago, maybe five, six years ago about R was that it didn't have as clear and readable syntax as Python did. But this has changed over the last few years 
with some of the packages specifically look up the tidyverse package this is an r package for working in data science specifically and also realize that r is not just popular in academia but also very many big companies do use it for particular tasks like ibm google facebook microsoft this is very common that large corporations would not use just one tool and this is why it's important to know python and r and sas the more of them that you can know the better it is so the most common thing i see is people learning python first then r and then some people if they happen to work for a company that uses sas especially people in the us india or brazil then they'll come along and then learn sas as well Let's now talk about SQL, or Structured Query Language. It is without a doubt one of the most requested skills in data science. You can think of SQL as a set of instructions that we can use to interact with a relational database. A lot of data is stored in relational databases. Examples of common relational databases are Microsoft SQL Server, Oracle Database, MySQL, and IBM DB2. Now, a relational database, if I was to give you an example of something that it's like, would be an Excel spreadsheet. Though databases and spreadsheets have quite a few differences, and relational databases have quite a few advantages that spreadsheets don't have, and a couple of those would be, and why they're used to store data, is data integrity and data validity. When it comes to data integrity, an example would be, let's say you hire a new employee, and there's a column with employee IDs. You have to give this person a new employee ID. Well, it's possible to make mistakes, and maybe you start putting in an ID that already exists. In a spreadsheet, that could happen no problem and uh, you would not pick up on the error but in a relational database it's going to tell you it's going to restrict it and make sure that each person has a unique employee id so that's an example of data integrity when it comes to data validity there's many different types of data validity the most common and simplest one is for example the ability and you can do this in spreadsheets as well is to make sure that a column is a particular data type and only that data type. Another example would be that you can only put certain ranges in that column. So again, this cuts down on errors and makes sure that you have uh, valid data. The point being, if you work in a company that stores its data in a SQL relational database, Chances are you're going to be using SQL to fetch your data so that you can model, describe, and visualize it. A clear benefit of SQL is also that it's designed to have syntax like the English language. So if you're one of those people that doesn't like programming that much, or that doesn't want to learn that many languages, and that wants to learn only the most important ones, I would go with Python, and then I would do SQL. So just to show you what I mean by SQL having a syntax like the English language, here's two simple SQL statements. One of them is the select statement. So if I want to select particular variables or columns, I do select ID comma first underscore name. So I'm saying I want to select the ID and the first underscore name column or variables. Then on the next line, I type from, so this is the from statement, and I take a space and write students. So students is the source, the name of the source of where I can retrieve these columns or variables from. Great. All right, so this is the section on a data science methodology. So methodology is all the different steps, the process, if you will, of doing data science. And if you remember 
earlier in the course in the opening section, I talked about data science being a process. So it's really the methodology that I was referring to. That whole thing is a process. So there's different steps. And it's also really useful to understand that this is an iterative process. So the steps are not one way. So just because you go to the data preparation step does not mean that you can't, that you just have to go forward onto the modeling now. You can certainly go backwards. Let's say, you know, you have your data set in the data preparation step, but you find that the data set is actually not very, very good. Well, then you would go back to the data understanding step and determine if you have maybe other sources where you can get your data that might be a better data set. Or maybe you need to find better methods of collecting that data. So it's an iterative process. Uh, so just keep that in mind. So let's take a look now at the methodology. It always starts at business understanding. So this is about getting clarity about the problem to be solved. And it's arguably the most important step, right? You have to know very clearly what is the problem to be solved. If you get this wrong right off the bat, well, then the other steps are in large part useless. So this requires good communication and clarity, and it's not a bad idea to spend a good portion of time on getting business understanding. And a common problem that you see at this stage is that there's diverging objectives because you have different uh, stakeholders involved in uh, the business. And these different stakeholders are also going to have their own biases. So these are all things that you're really going to have to hash out before moving to step number two in the methodology, which is data understanding. Now, data understanding is any activity that you're going to do that's related to constructing the data set. So this is going to include things like data collection, data requirements. Data requirements are simply what you need. So what you need to solve the problem that you have outlined in your business understanding uh, stage. So the step before it. And a key question here is if the data you collected is representative of the problem to be solved. So you really have to make sure about that. The next step is data preparation. So once you've collected the data, it has to be transformed into a usable subset. Unless, as I mentioned, it's determined that more data is needed. So you would go back to the data understanding stage. And it's this, it's at this stage that the data set is chosen. It has to be checked for questionable, missing, or ambiguous cases. On to the modeling step or stage. Once the data is prepared, you are going to try to build different models. And of course, ultimately, you're going to pick the best model. And modeling is always done on a portion of the overall data, so not the whole data set itself. And the process of choosing a model is a mix of both really science and art, and you'll appreciate that, I think, when we break things down a bit. Next, we have the evaluation. So the model that you select has to be tested at this stage you test or run the trained model on a new data set. So a data set it has not seen before. And the results here are going to determine what role, if any, it has in the final stage, which is the deployment stage. And really the modeling and evaluation steps, especially here, you see a lot of iteration they're very much linked. You could almost put them together in one step because you're trying different models. You're looking at the evaluation metrics to see how well that model performs based on what your goals are. And so you're doing a lot of back and forth. You're building models, you're evaluating, 
And if you don't like the model, if the metrics are not good, then you'll go back and try a different model and then evaluate that one. If the evaluation is not good there, you try a different model. So a lot of iteration here uh, in this spot. So in this final deployment stage is where people get familiar with the product that's produced. Often what happens is that the product gets tested by a limited group of users or in a test environment before being deployed to everybody. And it is also really common at this stage that problems are found where people think, oh, I think I see sort of variables that we kind of forgot about that probably should be included. Uh, you know, we might actually need a better data set you might have to go all the way back and do a bit of a revision of the business needs or the model or the data or both. Really common to have to iterate again and just do some updates, not necessarily, of course, scrap the whole thing, but iterate and make some small changes. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through the methodology using a real world example so it really sticks. All right, welcome to the first step or stage of data science methodology, business understanding. Okay, so I'm gonna set up a case study, which we're going to use throughout each step, throughout the whole methodology that is. So think of this situation. You have an American healthcare insurance provider, and Let's say that it's not an option to simply increase insurance costs. So that is to say that they can't simply raise the premiums or the amount that is being paid by patients who want to be insured in the case that they go to the hospital. So the question for the insurance company is, what's the best way to allocate the limited healthcare budget that they have to maximize its use in providing quality care to people. And in fact, out of all the sources of funding for the United States healthcare system, private health insurance is the largest one at $917 billion per year. Uh, you have out of pocket, so people pay out of pocket, that's 382 billion. You have Medicare, which is the coverage that older elderly people get in the US, that's at 572 billion a year. And Medicaid, which covers a low income Americans at 421 billion. And there's some other ones that are basically special programs, for example, for the military veterans affair, uh, those add up to 183. And all those healthcare dollars go primarily to hospitals and doctors. Not surprisingly, hospitals especially, but not by as much as you would think over doctors. Those are the two biggest uh, expenses. Then you have drugs and nursing and home care. And then very, very low, you have medical equipment, um, which is quite low in the big scheme of things. So you're in this situation. So the key thing here is you want to get clarity around the problem to be solved, which allows you, which allows us to determine which data will be used to answer the core question that we have. And ultimately, this directs the analytic approach that will be needed to address the question. And the first thing that you really need to do is you need to establish a clearly defined question. And to do that, it starts with understanding the goal of the person who's asking the question. So for example, if someone said, how can we reduce the treatment costs of acute myocardial infarction? So this is otherwise known as a heart attack. You might need clarification with this question because we're not quite sure what the goal of this person is when they say that. And I want you to think of why it's quite not sure what they're saying here. And really the answer is that we don't know if the goal or intention is to simply increase profitability 
or is the goal to actually improve efficiency when treating acute myocardial infarction? So you want to address that and make sure that the goal is very, very clear. So it's about improving efficiency, let's say, uh, in this case, making that whole process more efficient. Once you have the goal, the key is what objectives would support that goal. So if the goal is to improve the efficiency when treating acute myocardial infarction, what objectives would lead to that? Well, you might decide based on the different stakeholders at play and their knowledge, you decide that it makes sense to prioritize decreasing the readmission rate of acute myocardial inf in infraction. You notice that, you know, that's a huge problem, that that's a very high rate of people who, let's say, within a 30-day period of coming in for this problem, while well, they come back within 30 days to be readmitted because of some problem. So the efficiency would be figuring out why there's such a high rate in decreasing that high rate of readmissions that, that's occurring. So you would be hired to figure this, this out. So as an example, you would outline some business requirements for whatever model would ultimately end up being built. So it could be something like this. The first requirement would be to predict readmission outcomes for those patients with acute myocardial infraction. Two, to predict readmission risk. Three, understand the combination of events that led to the predicted outcome. And let's say apply an easy to understand process to new patients regarding their readmission risk. So notice we're including here extra things that helps the hospital staff in terms of being able to explain this new model that's been built so that the patients actually understand what their risks are based on this new work that you've done. So great, we're finished. Step one, business understanding. All right, so welcome to step two, which is data understanding. So assuming you know what kind of data is gonna be required, and you should know this because now you have a business understanding, you know what the goal is, you know what the objectives are, so you should know what kind of data you're gonna require. You're gonna go collect that data, so that's data collection, and now we have data understanding. And as I mentioned, re data requirements, data collection, and data understanding is together under this data understanding step. So in order to understand the data related to acute myocardial infarction, AMI, I'll say that now for short, descriptive statistics need to be run against the data columns that would become variables in the model. So this would include univariates and statistics on each variable, running the mean, median, minimum, maximum, and standard deviation. So can you think of some of the features or variables that would be part uh, of our data set that we would want to run some descriptive statistics on to figure out the means and the median and, and so forth, right? So you could have, you know, demographic information like age, so we could figure out what is the mean uh, of the age of these people uh, who, let's say, have a primary diagnosis of AMI. So that's why we have this data set because it's made up of, let's say, everybody whose primary diagnosis is AMI. So you might have their age, you could figure out the averages, the medians, the standard deviations of that. Maybe you have things like the number of procedures these people have had in their life, the number of medications that they're on, a uh, number of inpatient admits that they've had, number of outpatient visits, emergency visits. So here you're essentially just looking at patterns, if you can find any, by looking at each variable separately. Second, what you start doing is something called pairwise correlations or 
bivariate analysis where you start comparing two variables to see how correlated they are. And often when two variables are very highly correlated, it means that they would be essentially redundant to both include in a model. Third, you would want to produce some histograms of the variables or features to understand their distributions. So as an example, let's say you have a categorical variable and that categorical variable is the first symptom stated by the patient at onset of that myocardial infarction. And let's suppose that you've got many patients, let's say just as an example, you have 20 and every single patient gave you a different first symptom at the onset of their uh, myocardial infarction. So these are very distinct values from each of your patients. So if you had this situation, this might not be very relevant because it is just so different for everybody. It doesn't seem like it's going to tell you really uh, anything. But really doing the univariate analysis, the bivariate analysis, the histogram is all to assess your data quality, okay? Now, at this stage, what you want to do is you might want to recode certain values or even drop them if necessary. So let's say you have a variable that has many missing values for whatever that reason may be. The question then really becomes, does missing mean anything in that case? So sometimes missing value might mean zero. Other times it simply meant we don't know. So you really have to consider that. So now at this point, you're going to be consulting with doctors, with medical experts, people who have clinical experience, and they might be able to see that the data at this stage is not necessarily truly capturing what they see clinically. So as an example, maybe you only have a the meaning of acute myocardial infarction is based on a feature or variable of a primary diagnosis. So yes, they had, you have the people in the data set that had a primary diagnosis of a heart attack or acute myocardial infarction. But through clinical experience, they might know that many people who have a primary diagnosis of myocardial infarction have many other additional diagnoses, diagnoses that might have resulted in them being much more likely to have gotten that heart attack in the first place. So they might say, we need to go back to the data collection stage and we need to make sure that we add secondary and additional diagnoses that these patients have. It's not enough to just have their primary. So you see how we can go backwards just a little bit even to make sure that when we look at our data quality, it's based on consulting, we might need more information. So the last step, data understanding, you're really trying to find patterns, but you're not really doing anything about it at that point. You're just looking at it to sort of understand what you have. But it is really this step, data preparation, where you actually start taking action on these things. So there's really three main types of methods that are used to prepare data. The first can go under a category really called cleaning tasks. So this is where we drop that bad data that we saw from earlier or deal with missing values. I talked about that in the data understanding as well. So this is where you're actually going to deal with the missing values and get rid of them uh, however you decide to do it. There's also a second category of a method that you start preparing data and that's modification. So with modification, you're looking at things like normalizing your data or standardizing your data. All that happens here as well. And then a third category type of method of preparing data is creation or derivation of new features, usually from existing ones.
So we'll take a look at these in a little bit more detail. So when it comes to dealing with missing values, let's say you already have an idea from the previous step which variables or features have missing values where that's a problem. So there's really decisions to make here. This is decision time. You know, you might say, for example, if 98% of the records are missing, let's say you have a variable that's called weight. So it's the weight of the patients or uh, clients in the data set and 98% are missing. Well, you might find that that's a reason to drop it. Now, on the other hand, let's say you have a gender variable or feature and there's only three individuals that are missing it. Well, then you might just want to drop those particular records. You don't want to drop the whole actual column. It's really useful, most likely, but you can drop the records. And of course, there's other options as well. You would also want to drop the records of the patients who unfortunately died during hospital admission because, again, we're, of course, trying to predict the readmission and these people will have zero probability of readmission so as a result of that you'd want to make sure that they're not included as part of the data set and finally you really want to get rid of the variables or features that have the same value because these don't have any interpretive or discriminatory information for predicting readmission when it comes to creating or recoding new features, let me give you a couple of examples, one for creating and one for recoding. So let's say you have two individual variables. One is called time in hospital. So how many days a person spent in hospital. And you also have an individual variable called number of medications. So now what you could do is you could think maybe it would make sense if we times maybe there's a relationship between the number of medications and the time in hospital so you can do a new variable that's number of medications times the time in hospital or maybe you have another variable called number of procedures the person has been through you can do number of medications times the number of procedures so that variable could be very predictive, for example, of readmission. So feature engineering, this is sometimes called, and all you're doing is you're using the variables that you have or the features that you have individually, and you're combining them in some way to create a totally new feature that might be really useful. Now, when it comes to recoding new features, one of the common things that you see in healthcare data sets is that each diagnosis has a unique ICD code attached to it. So imagine we have a feature that's the primary diagnosis of the patient, a secondary diagnosis, and an additional diagnosis. So one solution is to take these ICD uh, unique codes and collapse them into fewer categories. So like medical categories like respiratory problems, digestive problems. So then that way you only have, let's say, eight to 10 categories that describe the diagnosis instead of having hundreds or thousands even, depending on how big your data set is. And by doing that, not only is it more manageable, more understandable, but it could become a more useful as a feature in terms of predicting readmission. Another thing that's common in this step is recoding the actual variables themselves. So let's say we have a gender or race variable or feature. So these are going to have string values. So gender is going to have male or female, let's say. And what you want to do in this case is you want to change it to a numeric. So for example, for gender, you might make female zero, male one, or the other way around, but it's just easier for algorithms when things are numeric and not string values. Now, another common thing you might see is, let's say you have an age variable, and instead of having the actual age of the patient at the diagnosis of their uh, myocardial infarction, Instead, you have categories of ages, so 40 to 50, 60 to 70, and so forth. So maybe 
we really want to see if there's an effect of age and it's harder to see when it's just a category so instead of seeing the effect of, of category of being in a certain category you want to see the actual age itself so a potential solution is that you assume the age of the patient on average lies at the midpoint of the age category another thing that you do at this stage this data preparation stage is to normalize your numerical features if they're highly skewed or they have excess kurtosis often it's done with log transformation so let's say you have a variable that's called the number of emergency visits and it's not a normal distribution to ensure that it's normally distributed you would do something like a log transformation standardization is another thing that you will encounter and standardization is solving the problem when your data has input values with differing scales so you don't want the way that something is measured so let's say weight compared to height or something like that you don't want simply the difference in scale the the fact that they're measured differently to impact how importantly they are seen by the algorithm another common task is to remove outliers so let's say anything within three standard deviations and you'll learn about this in statistics on either side of the distribution you might get rid of those data points interaction of terms is another thing that you look at i kind of mentioned it in the prior stage you're looking at if variables have interdependent effects you usually set up a correlation metrics of the predictor variables to see which ones are highly correlated and you might want to drop uh, one of those and data ba balancing finally is often needed in our situation let's say you're gonna have a data set where there's very many more people that weren't readmitted than were readmitted so let's say the percent of people that were readmitted is only 10%. That means 90% didn't get readmitted. So one technique to balance the data is called oversampling, and this prepares your data set for further steps. Join me in the next step where we do modeling. All right, so we've arrived at the modeling step or stage. And if you remember from earlier in the methodology, I mentioned that we don't use the whole data set to build our first model. We actually split it up, sometimes in two or three. And what we work with is called a training set. And in our case, we are, of course, looking for patients that are at higher risk of readmission so the outcome of interest or the outcome variable where the outcome of interest is whether somebody gets readmitted so yes or no if they're readmitted for an acute myocardial infarction and often you would recode the outcome variable as well so no zero yes one just like we did with the predictor variables where we had the categorical variables like gender and initially it might the values might have been male female well we changed it to numeric uh, binary so zero and one instead to represent male and female now whenever the outcome of interest or the outcome variable can go into one class or another or one group or another so if they got readmitted or not in our case that's called a by class variable but you can also have a multi-class outcome variable where somebody can fit into more groupings or classes so this would be called a classification problem because you're trying to decipher which bucket the thing goes into if you will so you use what are called classification algorithms. Some of the popular ones are logistic regression, decision tree, and random forest. So just to reiterate, whenever you have an outcome variable or a response variable that is categorical 
or discrete, so discrete categories or classes, you have a classification problem and you should use a classification algorithm. Something like logistic regression or a decision tree, let's say. And logistic regression, that second part of regression is not the best name for it because people see that and they think, well, this must be a regression algorithm. It's not. But regression problems, on the other hand, have an output variable or response variable that is numerical or continuous. So let's say that you wanted each row or observation represented a home and you wanted to predict how much you could sell that home for. Well, you would get back a number and it could be any number, right? You could, it could be $352,452 or it could be $378,421. It could be any number. That's what we mean by continuous. It's not going to be just like, will this house get sold in the next 90 days? Yes or no. So yes or no would be a discrete category. That would be a classification problem. So you really want to try all of these potential algorithms to see which one gets you the best results. Ultimately, the model that you select is going to depend on what your goals are. So you go back to the business understanding part and really understand what the goal is here. So of course, the big aim is to understand how all these different predictors are impacting readmission, but it might also be important, and it was in our case, that the model is very easy to interpret, so we can actually devise corrective measures and put those things in place. Otherwise, even if you get a good prediction model, but it's not very easily interpretable, then you might not be able to take corrective uh, actions. So one key factor when selecting a model is that when you use a decision tree model, it's easier to interpret than a logistic regression model. And this is in part because decision trees make decisions in line with how human beings make decisions. So let me put up on the screen here, this is an example of a decision tree as you can see, the decision tree only shows two levels, but this tree does have many more levels that are not shown here. In any case, the simple idea between a decision tree is that all the variables get compared in terms of how much they contribute to the prediction. So it's almost like they have a fight. Two variables get compared and they have a fight and a hierarchy comes out with what is the factor that is the most uh, important for the model and so forth. So, and that is very similar to how humans make decisions, right? We consider this and this, we compare and we're like, okay, this thing wins out. Now let's compare it to this other variable, which one wins here and so forth until you have this sort of hierarchy. A second thing that's really important to consider is the relationship between the predictors and the outcome. Is it mostly linear relationship or is it nonlinear? This really can change things a lot. Decision trees tend to do a lot better when there's a non-linear relationship between the predictors and the outcome variables. And I want to show you why this is the case with this diagram here. So an important concept to know here is a decision boundary. So whether an observation goes into zero or one, into the readmission category or no readmission category depends on the decision boundary. So one advantage of decision trees, if you've got nonlinear relations between predictors and the outcome variable, is that it can create these more complex, more relevant decision boundaries, meaning it should classify observations more accurately than logistic regression in this circumstance. And finally, as I mentioned in the intro to this data science methodology section, the modeling step and evaluation really go hand in hand. I've split it up here so I can describe both to you sort of independently, 
but you try different models and then you check the evaluation metrics for it to see if it's a good model. So thanks, and I hope you enjoyed the lecture. Well, congrats for getting to the evaluation step of data science methodology. So evaluating a model is a core part of building an effective machine learning model. The choice of metric is going to depend on the type of model and the implementation plan of the model. Now, if you remember, we used a classification model or a classification algorithm because we have a classification type problem. Putting something into a discrete group, zero, one, yes, no. Of course, it could also be multi-group, multi-class. In any case, since we have that kind of model, we need to look at specific metrics. So here's a bunch of metrics that we can do because our model is a classification one. And here's a look at some other types of metrics that we would consider if we had or we had used a regression model. Now this is a really important thing as well. Before you predict on unseen data, you should consider the metrics first. So if you remember, I said that you need to split your data, you need a training set and at least a test set. So you're going to be trying out the model on this test set. You do not want to be trying it on a totally new data set. So this is what we mean. Try the metric, see how well the model performs on the test data. Now I'm going to cover three metrics, accuracy, recall, and precision. But I first want to show you something called a confusion matrix, which will help you understand how we come up with accuracy, recall, and precision. So take a look here. It's really useful to think about each of the observations in the data set as potentially falling into one of these four categories. So the first would be the true positive observation. So this would be a patient was readmitted and the model predicted the same that they would be readmitted. So that's true positives. So think about a certain number of observations falling into that category. Then we have false positives. So these are the patients that were not readmitted, but the model predicted that they would be readmitted. Then we have the false negatives. These were the patients that were readmitted, but the model predicted that they would not be readmitted. And then we have the true negatives, which are patients that were not readmitted and model showed the same, that they would not be readmitted. So those are your true negatives. So question time for you now, which one of these four would be the biggest concern for us? Which one would we want to really avoid? So let me just give you a few seconds to think about that. And since this is just a start in data science for you, do not be concerned if you don't get it right away. This is actually one of the more confusing things that people kind of get wrong at the beginning. But the answer is the false negatives. So we want to really avoid the situation where patient was readmitted, but the model predicted that they would not be, because this is the whole point of creating this model. Remember back in the business understanding, we said we really want to cut down on readmissions. We want to improve the efficiency of this. So this is the thing that we really want to avoid. Now, before we look at the metrics, I do want to cover a few more concepts. You'll always hear about these since they are fundamental to model building and model evaluation. So you'll hear about underfitting. So underfitting is when the model or algorithm cannot capture the underlying trend of the data. What this ultimately means is that the model or the algorithm does not fit the data well enough. 
In this case, it is said that the model or algorithm shows low variance but high bias. Overfitting, on the other hand, happens when the model or algorithm captures the noise of the data. Intuitively, what this means is that the model or algorithm fits the data too well. This is referred to as a situation where there's high variance but low bias. The most common reason for a model that underfits is that it's way too simple. And not surprisingly, the most common reason for a model overfitting is because it's too complicated. The best way to remember that underfitting is essentially bias and that overfitting is essentially variance is to think of the real world. People are often biased when they use too few variables to explain an outcome. Therefore, simple model. On the other hand, when a model gets so complicated and convoluted, you get so far away from the truth as well. And that's where you have your variance. So this is always something that you're gonna have to balance. So there's a trade-off between bias and variance or underfitting and overfitting. There's also other reasons why a model or algorithm can underfit or overfit. One of them is that you just didn't train for enough iterations. There's others as well, but we won't get into that for now. So let's take a look at the three metrics here. So I'll start with accuracy. So accuracy is simply the true positives plus the true negatives divided by the total. So all four, true positives plus false positives plus true positives plus true negatives. So in simple words, the accuracy metric is simply the ratio of the total number of correct predictions divided by the total number of predictions. So it's a metric that certainly makes sense intuitively, but often it's not advisable to use accuracy, but it's better to use precision and recall. And there's also a trade-off between precision and recall. So you can't have both at the same time. If you want high recall, then you're gonna need lower precision. If you want higher precision, you're gonna have slightly lower recall and so forth. Now, generally the problem with relying on accuracy as the main metric is that you often have somewhat at least unbalanced data sets, meaning you have quite a bit more of the non-readmission observations in our case compared to the readmission cases. Even when you oversample, there's gonna be a bit of a difference. So it's fairly easy to get a good accuracy the more that you have an imbalance in the data set. And there's always a little bit of an imbalance, right? So that's the main really reason. So we want to focus more on precision and especially recall. When we look at the precision formula, it's true positives over true positives plus false positives. And what precision ultimately tells us is when the patient was not readmitted and the model predicted that they would be. So this is important because this is a potentially a waste of resources where we maybe keep someone longer in hospital than we would have because it was predicted that they would actually be readmitted. But maybe it's not as a big problem as if our recall was lower. So when it comes to recall, recall is true positives over true positives plus false negatives. And what recall is it tells you for all the patients who were readmitted, the model predicted that they would be readmitted. And this is really what our focus is. This is also recall is also called sensitivity. So let's say when we evaluate our model and we see the recall, it says the recall has a 0.93. This would mean that in 93% of cases, the patients who were readmitted, the model in fact predicted that they would be readmitted. So I hope you enjoyed that and I'll see you in the next lecture.
All right, so let's discuss deployment. So deployment is highly dependent on what the product that you've created ultimately is. Who is the end user is also, of course, going to matter. What's really useful is to go back to the beginning, the business understanding portion and the business requirements portion and realize that really what we're interested in is a model where we can predict readmission outcomes. Uh, so we're really interested in finding a way to provide to the end user. So in our case, the end user here could be whoever is working for the insurance company. So you can set something up to deal with readmission risk. Maybe hospitals would need access to this. Maybe the actual person that has the insurance, the person that's covered, might need access to this information. So how it's going to de get deployed depends on really what the tactic is on how you're going to handle this. So one way that you can handle it, of course, is you make sure that in some way the people that are working for your company, for your insurance company, have access to readmission risk. So maybe that readmission risk gets calculated or recalculated um, every once in a while and the only people that get access to it is is the insurance company itself because you're going to be the one that's going to be leading the solution so maybe the goal is that the insurance company uh, if they find that somebody is at a really high readmission risk or the insurance company knows that a certain person that's, that has a high readmission risk is currently in hospital, you can set up a certain process where based on whatever the readmission risk factors are, you can set up a process where you deal with the problem. So let me give you an example. So let's say that one of the variables that impacts readmission risk for acute myocardial infarction is that patients generally don't follow aftercare instructions. So they leave the hospital, they, let's say number one, they neglect their meds, they forget about follow-ups or, you know, they simply don't go for follow-ups. So you set up a system. So if you figure out that these two variables, let's say the biggest one was when patients forgot, forgot to go to a follow-up, that was the biggest risk factor, or they neglected to take their meds, they just forgot or didn't realize that it was really important. And the way that you can make solve this problem is to simply set up an process where you could contact these people as soon as they get released from hospital you call them and you say we're just calling to make sure that you remember that you have to take this and this medication and that this and this these are the reasons why it's important and please take it if if you don't have the funds maybe you know we have the system in place to make sure that you take them uh, and so forth and so forth. So you're just setting up a process so that your patients decrease the risk of going back into hospital. So maybe the system is that patients are phoned within 48 hours after they're discharged and asked if they've obtained their meds and scheduled their follow-up. You could of course structure this in many different ways. You could also pay hospitals for performance. Pay them for specifically following these guidelines that you found out. So if you see that a particular patient is high risk of readmission, they get extra money based on following these procedures. So making sure that they phone the patient within 48 hours, 
and so forth. So they don't necessarily need access to the, the model that's predicting readmission risk. What they need you to do is, in essence, make sure that part of the funding that they get from you is based on specific performance metrics. Now, when it comes to more specifically the model itself and the deployment of the technology itself, so let's say that we only need to deploy the technology, the product, the model to the employees of the insurance company so that they know risk very well when it comes to the different members, the different people that have insurance with them. Well, you might put that data into a database and then you have dashboards, so some sort of business intelligence tool that is going to create and update that dashboard. So maybe they would use that dashboard to see the different predictions of risk and so maybe that dashboard tracks people that are currently in hospital. You get to see the different risk of all those patients based on the many different variables at play uh, in the data set. So that way the insurance company can know where to put their resources, which are the more uh, likely customers to cost more so they know where to focus on, which is really, really important. And let's say that the dashboard gets updated every 24 hours. So this is a simple example of a healthcare insurance company first understanding what the problem is, defining that problem, and then going to the point of deploying that product. So deploying is about taking that end product and deploying it to whatever end user needs that information. So in our case, who needs the information? It's the employees of the insurance company. By having the information, by having a true representation of the risk of readmission, they can come up with a process, a simple process, to make sure that the resources are going to the right patients to ultimately ensure that readmission does not occur. All right, so chatbots have different names. Some people call them chatbots. Some people call them virtual assistants, virtual agents, all those things. We're really referring to the same thing. And chatbots, of course, are really popular when it comes to customer service. You know, when you order a pizza, for example, that's really just a chat bot. And a lot of people, of course, use it because it can augment or totally replace human agents. How many of us anymore actually call the pizza place? Uh, I don't. I'll go online uh, to places like Skip the Dishes, let's say, and just order it from there. And, you know, it's good for the companies in terms of not having to hire extra people to answer calls. So there's a cost saving thing. And of course, the fact that it's available 24 uh, seven. But of course, it's not just for ordering pizza. It's used by banks as well. Banks are, are really starting to utilize it more. Capital One recently came out with a bot where people can text the bot. They can use it when they use the mobile app for Capital One. They can use it when they're doing online banking and it allows customers to check, for example, their account balance, due date for certain bills and, and so forth. But of course, this extends beyond being able to order a pizza or check your bank information. Really, the goal of IBM in their own words, I'll read just a little portion here, I quote, the goal is to have computers start to interact in natural human terms across a range of applications and processes, understanding the questions that humans ask and providing answers that humans can understand and justify. So the way to think about it is that a chatbot interface makes sense for customer service, but it's totally conceivable and they're already testing this out. 
you can set up a different kind of interface, let's say for physicians to help them with diagnosis and treatment advising. So they could type in what type of symptoms, let's say a patient has, and it can, the computer can get back based on the computer's analysis of different things, electronic medical record data, notes from healthcare providers, research material, clinical studies can come back with a diagnosis or treatment advice. So really exciting and you can be a part of this if you get into data science. All right, so to work on our chatbot, you are going to need to sign up for a free account. Yes, absolutely free on the IBM website. So you can type in IBM Watson Assistant sign up in Google and it should be one of the first um, things that you find. You see if you type in here IBM Watson Assistant sign up in Google often it's one of the first things that pops up it says Watson Assistant IBM Cloud or you can directly go to the website ibm.com slash cloud slash Watson dash assistant and I'll just put it on the screen as well and then you're just going to want to click here get started for free in the rare case that you already have you are a user you can of course just log in otherwise just click here and there's just a bunch of stuff that you're going to have to um, add here, email, password, verify email, a little bit of personal information, and you should be in. Now, I already, of course, have an account, so I can go to log in. So I'll just click on log in here. I'll press continue, log in. And it can take, you know, maybe up to 20 seconds, depending how fast your system is. Might even take a little bit longer, 30, 40 seconds, but no doubt it will load up for you. And it should look something like this. And I'll leave it here. Uh, we are going to pick up from this point on in the next video. Thank you. All right, so let's start working on building a Watson Assistant or our chatbot. So the first thing is first, we're gonna click up here, create assistant. And here it asks you to type in an assistant name. It says name your assistant, for example, banking or customer care. So let's just say healthcare, okay? So let's say we provide healthcare services and we're gonna say, we provide medical, dental, and psychological services. Okay, so something like that. And we will do create assistant. So it will take you here then. And you don't have to worry about what it says here, the actions. So this is uh, something that's new that's been added to Watson Assistant. And this search here is a plus feature. So this is something that you actually have to pay for. So the only thing that we're interested in is actually this dialogue skill part here. So just do uh, dialogue skill. And then right here where it says add existing skill. And that's all we need. And by the way, what that does, I'll show you in just a second. So we're gonna click on here. So the skill that we created, and actually, let me just go backwards for one second. You'll notice that it says two zero intents, zero entities, two dialogue nodes. So when we click in here, we're gonna go here to dialogue. And this is what it means by two dialogue nodes. So it's created for us by adding a dialogue skill. It created a welcome node and an anything else node, okay? So of course, dialogue is just another word for conversation. So the dialogue has to do with what a chatbot is going to say based on the context. So what is happening? So 
you have your welcome node here and this is simply how is the assistant going to respond when a customer uh, activates the chatbot well here it has a text we've decided it's going to have a text hello how i can how can i help you so of course if we want you know we can add other variations so that the chatbot doesn't welcome everybody in the exact same way each time and you can even change the response variation to for example it can be random which text pops up and then of course we have our second note the anything else note now think about it right at this point we haven't trained our chatbot to really do anything aside from welcome people so when the user activates the chatbot brings it up that is they're going to get a welcome but aside from that we haven't really trained it to do anything else so if the user then starts typing in anything it's not going to recognize it so what's going to so that that is what the anything else is for if i then start saying oh i'd like to make an appointment for with my doctor or something uh, or a medical appointment it's not going to understand so it's just going to do one of these responses right here i didn't understand you can try rephrasing can you reword, reword your statement i'm not understanding i didn't get your meaning so that's the only thing that it can do at this point in time so next video we're going to do the first part of this which is going to be creating an intent All right, so we have our healthcare services company, and the first thing that we're going to have to take care of are something called intents. So intents are simply things that your customers might want to do when they interact with your chatbot. So you have to think, what is a goal that your customer might have? So if you're a healthcare services company, they might want to book an appointment, let's say, with your chatbot. So we'll go and click on an intents and we'll create our first intent. And you just need to click right here, create intent. And you see this hashtag here, that always goes before an intent. And we're gonna give it a name, book appointment, book underscore appointment, the description is optional. We don't really need it. It's quite straightforward what it is. So we'll just click create intent. So the next thing you notice down here, what pops up is user example. And right under it's gonna tell you exactly what to do. Add unique examples of what the user might say. And then it says pro tip, add at least five unique examples to help Watson understand. So what might a user say if they want, if they have the goal of booking an appointment? Okay. So maybe they're going to type something like, I want to book an appointment. Okay. So then once one of your examples is finished, you just put add example, click on add example. Now you might have also noticed on the right hand side here there's a thing that says recommended examples but you'll also notice that it there's a plus it says it's part of plus so this is one of those paid features we are using something called watson assistant light but again you have to understand that large companies actually use this service to develop their chatbots so we're not going to worry about that we're just going to add a few more examples we really don't need for what we're doing for what i want to show you we really don't even need uh, any more but let's add a few more maybe somebody says i want to make an appointment okay so we'll add that maybe i need an appointment i need a appointment stuff like that and generally that's totally fine 
Again, the point of adding these user examples is that the assistant learns to recognize what the intent is from these user examples. And as I said, five or more examples is usually what it needs, often though it works with less as well. So now we're going to return to the main skill page. So we just click right here. And now, as you see, it says right up here, my first skill. So what we're going to do now is we're going to build a dialogue. And what the dialogue defines, and we can click on it right here, is it defines what your assistant is going to say in response to the customer's message. So we need to connect the intent that you created to a dialogue node. You can see that two pre-built dialogue nodes, we already have those because we added the skill at the beginning, welcome and anything else. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna click to add a new dialogue node. So like right here, we can name our dialogue node here. These names are optional as you can see. So you can always leave this blank and come back to it later. Now below where you name the node, if you want, as mentioned, it's optional. You have the if assistant recognizes. So this is where if you click inside it, this pops up where it says filter by intense entities, context variables. So if you do intense, you have this hashtag and then you, you want to find and it will pop up as well the intent that we just created. So book appointment. So if the assistant recognizes the book appointment intent, which we set up and we trained the chatbot by giving it some examples of things that somebody might say if they were interested in, in booking an appointment. So if it recognizes this, we're going to have the assistant respond with some text. So maybe we'll say the the chatbots can say, sure thing, what kind of appointment do you need? Because remember, we're offering medical, dental, and psychological services, so we don't know uh, what kind. And then assistant should wait for a reply. So that's totally fine. The rest of it is no problem. So we can click out of that and you'll see that it's right in the middle here and it says that it has one response. So we have our dialogue node. The final part for this lecture anyways is to try it out. So right up here on the right hand side there's a try it button. You click on that. Sometimes you're going to see right up here right above the hello or the start of the dialogue you'll see something that says Watson is training. If that's occurring, wait for that tag to disappear because it will be training. So you want it to finish training before you actually attempt it. So with that out of the way, we're going to try to test it out. So I want to make an appointment. And notice what happens. So this is a good sign. You'll notice if you go over this eye looking thing, it says 1.00. That means it 100% understood what we were trying to do. And you'll notice here that it brought up our intent. So that's why there's a 1.00 beside it because it knew that that's exactly what we wanted based on the user examples that we provided. So that's really good. So remember, when you have a really complex chatbot, you're gonna have many different intents under here. So it might then get mixed up if it's not trained that well, if the examples it was provided aren't very good. So you see different numbers here. So it might get confused between three different ones. One intent is going to win out, but it might have won out by a really small margin. So maybe the intent that won out had a 0.37, the intent the lost had a 0.35 so really close i mean good that the chatbot understood ultimately but it was too close so you might need to feed it with more better examples and you'll of course also know that it picked up 
the right intent and then it got the right dialogue. Sure thing, what kind of appointment do you need? So we'll pick up with the idea of entities in the next lecture. All right, so great job on the intense section. We're gonna talk in this lecture about entities and entities is another concept. And entities are about your users or your customers being able to get targeted responses to their intents. So the intent is of course reviewing it's to book an appointment, right? So that's their goal. The entity is going to help our assistant identify the different appointment types that a customer might want to choose from. So I want you to go ahead up here and click entities. And we can close this off just so it doesn't bother us. And then we'll do create entity. And you'll notice that this one has a at sign, unlike the hashtag for the intent. And let's just call it appointment underscore type, okay? And under, you'll notice it says name your entity to match the category of values that it will detect, okay? So we'll do create intent. And now we're gonna add some entity values. So the assistant is going to look for terms in the customer or user messages that match these entity values. So one value we're gonna have is medical, okay? So if somebody wants to make a medical appointment. So I'm gonna hit add value. So let's add a couple of more values. What if somebody wants to make a dental appointment? So we'll do value dental. And one thing you might've noticed, and there's a couple of ways of doing it, this thing here is available to be clicked on, recommend synonyms. So these are words and phrases that are related to dental. It can be quite useful. So let's actually click on it here and see what we get for dental. So there's some useful ones like dentistry is useful, orthodontic, if I know my dentistry well, I believe that's related to dentistry. Um, how about there's dentists here endodontics. I think this is also related to dentistry. So I'll click on that. And then there's a thing up here that says add selected. Okay. So add selected. Great. And then I'm just going to do add value here. Okay. So this way we have our value of dental, but we have also synonyms in case somebody says I want a orth orthodontic appointment, they still want a dental appointment, right? So that's why we're doing that. By the way, another feature that's really cool is this fuzzy matching. So this is in case somebody spells a word wrong, well, this is going to hopefully the system will be able to pick it up. So that's another thing that's useful. And then let's add finally psychology or psychological. And let's see synonyms if something will help. Okay, there's actually a lot of really useful ones here. So they might say they want a behavioral, yeah, let's let's use some of these uh, cognitive mental mental appointment. It's, it's conceivable that somebody would say that. Um, maybe if they knew therapy, they might say psychosocial or something. Uh, uh, maybe they would use this word. But anyways, what you're trying to do is any word that might make sense, you might want to add it and then I'll just do add value. So good, we're done with that. Now what we're gonna do is go back into the dialogue and connect our entity to the dialogue flow. So we'll click up here and then we'll click on dialogue. We have our drop down. We're gonna go to the last dialogue that we worked on, which is the book appointment. We're gonna click on it. And then we're going to add child node. So not add node, but add child node. So there we are. Again, we have an option if we wanna give this node a name. But what we're going to do here is for if assistant recognizes, we are going to, instead of this time selecting an intent, we are going to select an entity 
So entity, okay, there we go. So appointment type, and we're gonna say operator any, okay. And then what do we want the assistant to respond with in terms of text? Well, we're going to say something like sure thing, we can set you up for and for a so you need to use the at and then appointment type checkup okay so we're then ready to try it out so we'll go up here and try it how can i help you I want to make an appointment. You got the intent perfectly fine. 1.00 can't get better than that. Sure thing. What kind of appointment do you need? Okay. Well, I'm going to say I need a dental appointment. Dental. Sure thing. We can set you up for a dental checkup. And notice that it understood 1.00 that I was looking for a dental appointment. Now, sometimes it might not. And what you need to do, it might say irrelevant, just like this, where I put dentist, it didn't understand what you need to do to train it. So as you go over the eye looking thingy, you can see that it was 0.18 only confident that you were referring to a dental appointment. So not very confident at all. So what you want to do to train it is you change from irrelevant and you tell it what intent you meant. You meant for the book appointment. And it says intent correction submitted and the model is learning. And now notice this Watson is training part. So it's going to learn from you telling it what I meant was I wanted to book an appointment. Okay. So it's going to go into the system and it can take a while. Sometimes it takes usually up to a minute. It, it doesn't take much longer. I wouldn't expect it to take more than two minutes. There have been some issues in the past where they have to fix something. It's something wrong on their end and it can take half a day or something like that. Um, it's happened occasionally, but hopefully it doesn't happen for you when you try to uh, work with it. So might take a little bit more, but in any case, the whole point is you always want to help it out and give it some new information. And the more it trains, the more it's next time that you use, say, dentist, I want to a dentist appointment, it's actually going to understand what you mean. So that's actually going to do it for this video. All right, so hope you've had fun working on our healthcare services chatbot so far. And in fact, we're going to stop here in terms of building it up. There's quite a few more concepts that you can learn about on your own. But of course, the course is not about making a chatbot using a machine learning service, but it's to get you excited about the possibilities uh, of creating such a thing and being part of a team that creates such a thing and to understand how it works. So it's to get those juices flowing, if you will. Now, I'm going to click back in here. And again, if you would like to learn more about it, IBM has done a very good job. And up here, there's, there's a learning center part. So there's actually guided tours for specific things. So it goes, there's a section about improving your dialogue. There's a section on something called slots. So again, it's going to take you step by step when it comes to these things. Multiple conditioned responses. Again, you have to finish the slots tour first to get to that. And then you can look at something called digressions as well. And then there's an additional resources here. Uh, there's a getting started section uh, that goes into step-by-step -step 
creating intents, adding in uh, entities, and so forth. And then after you go through these step by step, if you click on the question mark here, you could go to the blog or really uh, the, read the documentation as well. The documentation is really, really good. Over here on the left hand side, you have sort of a getting started, uh, getting started section, a tutorials. So how to build a complex dialogue, adding a node with slots. So I think a really good way of going about this is to start with the learning center, go through it all, and then go to the documentation by clicking here on this question mark and going to read the documentation. The blog that Watson has is also very useful. It leads you to also Stack Overflow and all these kinds of things, which are really, really useful. All right, so let me talk to you about libraries. So you're going to hear a lot about libraries as you work through data science. And a straight definition to kind of get things started is the libraries are just a collection of functions and methods that allow you to perform a wide variety of actions without writing the code yourself. So typically, as you start learning a new programming language like Python, you learn about things like data types, variables, different kinds of data structures like lists. And soon enough, you come to learning about functions. So you learn about what functions are, but you also start learning how to create your own functions. So the great thing about libraries is that instead of having to create your own functions so they can perform certain actions, you already get a whole bunch that are ready to use so they can perform a certain function or an action, if you will. Now, I'll mostly be focusing on Python libraries. So let's start. First, there's NumPy. NumPy allows you to work with arrays. This means that if you're in a field that's heavy on numerical computing or numerical analysis, NumPy has the right tools for you. For example, it offers comprehensive mathematical functions, random number generators, linear algebra routines, Fourier transforms, and more. Next, there's the Pandas library. Pandas is actually built on top of NumPy. Pandas offers data structures and tools for effective data cleaning, manipulation, and analysis. This means in part that it's easy to read in data that you might have in an Excel file or a CSV file or so forth. It means it's easy to reshape and pivot your data sets. It's easy to merge and join and a lot more. Next, you certainly need good tools for data visualization. It's really important to be able to communicate with others and show the meaningful results of your analysis. Such libraries allow you to create graphs, charts and maps. In Python, matplotlib is the most well-known library for data visualization, and it's great for making graphs and plots. The graphs are also highly customizable. For more specialized plots, Seaborn is great. Seaborn is actually built on top of matplotlib and makes it easy to generate plots like heat maps, time series, and violin plots. Next, you have scikit-learn. This is a library for machine learning that contains tools for statistical modeling, including things like regression, classification, clustering, and others. It's built on top of NumPy and SciPy and Matplotlib, and it's pretty easy to get started with it. For example, you generally just need to define the model and specify the parameter types you would like to use. Now, when you get far into your data science journey, you might be interested in deep learning. And if you are, you're going to be able to use the Kerash library to build your deep learning models. One great thing about both Kerash and Scikit-learn is that they both have a high level interface. All this means is that the complexity is hidden, which allows you to build models quickly and simply. 
Finally, you should know about TensorFlow. We've talked a little bit about the deployment of your product or your model when it comes to the data science methodology. So you'll hear about TensorFlow in the future. It's used in large scale production of deep learning models. Finally, let me say a little bit about R and its libraries. So R has built in functionality for both machine learning and data visualization, but there are some complementary libraries out there that are commonly used. ggplot2 is one of those. It's a popular library for data visualization. You can also use libraries that enable you to interface with Karash and TensorFlow when you're using R. Now, the final thing I'll mention is that the difference between SAS and R and Python is that SAS is a proprietary software, meaning it costs money. So as a student, you essentially get SAS base, and that has a particular functionality. It can do most things, but it doesn't have, let's say, particular graphing capabilities. But don't be discouraged by this. You can totally learn the SAS programming language by using the free software. All it means is that you might not be exposed to the whole range of capabilities that SAS has because it's proprietary software that only large corporations, large enterprises have access to. All right, so let's talk about application programming interfaces or APIs. Generally speaking, if a data scientist is talking about an API, they're talking about what are called REST or RESTful APIs. And REST stands for Representational State Transfer. In practice, what this means is that you're implementing an API that uses the Hypertext Transfer Protocol, or HTTP, to send information to or retrieve information from another service. So the bottom line is that as a future data scientist, you'll be using HTTP or HTTPS connections to communicate between applications. There's really two main things that you'll be doing with APIs in your career. The first, and most of you will fit into this category, and most of us fit into this category, it's you'll be using APIs. You'll use them to access data, let's say, from remote services. So you might access uh, tweets using the Twitter API. Now, in my Python for Data Science course, where I teach people how to do Python programming, I did this exact thing. So in Python, there's this package called requests, and it allows you to access, in my case, it was accessing comments in Reddit. And then when we got access to those comments, we did some data analysis on them. So specifically, what I did is used something called a GET request. It's one of the more basic requests you can make, very similar to the request that's made by your web browser every time you visit a web page. In R, there's a similar package that allows you to do such requests. It's called HTTR package. Now, I won't get too technical here, but once you do get access to that data, you usually receive it in what's called XML or JSON, JavaScript Object Notation Format, and you often need to use helper functions to reshape it into something that you can actually work with. So you can do the data analysis, let's say. We won't go into the details there. Again, that is in my Python for Data Science course if you are interested. So hopefully that's useful. Just to give you another couple of use cases when it comes to APIs. Earlier in the course, we talked about when we went through the data science methodology, we talked about creating a risk model. Well, let's say you wanted to provide whoever the end user is the latest model score for a particular customer, and you wanted to do that on demand, you would do it via APIs. A second example is you've got an end user who is using a web service. So they're logging into a website. 
to see advanced analytics and you want to add some functionality to those advanced analytics and let's say you want to incorporate some a plot of some kind onto that website you would do it via APIs okay so let's talk about data sets so first a simple definition of a data set is that it's a structured collection of data so data can be represented as text, numbers, or as media, for example, as images, audio files, or video files. When it comes to the most common type of format for a data set, you'll find it's usually an Excel spreadsheet file, or CSV format is also quite common. And this is a single file that's organized as a table of rows and columns but other data sets can be stored in other formats and they don't have to be just one file. Sometimes a data set may be a zip file or a folder containing multiple data tables with related data. As mentioned, CSV files are quite common. CSV, by the way, stands for comma separated values. It's also referred to as a tabular data format. So once again, Whenever you have a collection of rows, which in turn compromise columns, this is referred to as a tabular data structure. So let me give you an example. Imagine we have a data set of observations from a hospital that's been keeping track of patients who have come in because they felt some sort of lump or tumor on their breasts. Eventually, these patients got a diagnosis of malignant or benign. So in that case, you have each row is representing each patient and all of their information, while the column contains information of, about what is being tracked for all of these patients. So you've got each of their IDs, you've got each of their diagnoses, you've got the radius of that tumor texture, perimeter, area, all the things, symmetry, all these different things that would be important when you're evaluating uh, breast cancer and being able to classify whether somebody has something to worry about or not. But the main point is that each row is representing the specific information for that particular patient while the columns are the different variables that are being considered for all the patients. Other types of data structures that are less common, you have hierarchical data. That type of data is organized in a tree-like structure. You also have network data that's usually stored as a graph. For example, the connections between people on a social networking website are often represented in the form of a graph. Now, another important question is, how are data sets created? Well, data sets can be created in a few different ways. In my previous video on APIs, I talked about how you can use requests, specifically a simple GET request, to get access to data from Twitter or Reddit. Reddit is what I focused on. So very quickly, you can get access to data and turn it, put it in a data structure that you can do data analysis on or whatever you want to do with it. So that's certainly one way, but often it's just researchers or academics of some kind keeping track of particular data and deciding later on I'm going to make this data available to the general public. And to be fair, it's not only academia that are doing this. You have different scientific institutions, different governments, you have even regular companies starting to make data sets available to the public as open data, which is providing a lot of great information for free. Now, before we actually look at places where you could get some data sets to work with, it is important to know that sometimes there is restrictions to use of these data sets, and this is defined by licensing terms. Now, the most lax type of licenses are Creative Commons licenses. So these generally have no strings attached or you might just require to credit the person if you use their data. 
You might also hear about CDLA sharing license and CDLA permissive license. So the CDLA sharing license grants you permission to use and modify the data. The license stipulates that if you publish your modified version of the data, you must do so under the same license terms as the original data. The CDLA permissive, on the other hand, grants you permission to use and modify the data. However, you're not required to share changes to the data. It's important to also note that neither license imposes any restrictions on the results you might derive by using the data which is certainly important in data science. This means that, for example, if you train the model using this CDLA license data set, you're under no obligation to share the model or to share it under a specific license if you do choose to share it. So here are some of my favorite places where you can find some data sets. NASA is one good one. NASA, being a publicly funded government organization, has all of its data public. So if you want data sets that are related to Earth science and space, go on to their website. You can even sort by format on the Earth science site to find all of the available CSV data sets, for example. Another great option is the 538 website. It's a popular news and sports site started by Nate Silver. They actually have the data sets on their GitHub. We will link to that GitHub. They have a data set on drugs, data on who's taken Adderall in the US specifically. They have some historical weather data and some airline safety data set uh, that contains information on accidents from each airline. The final one I would mention is Kaggle. It's a data science community that hosts machine learning competitions. There's a lot of amazing real world data sets available there. And you can also join competitions and win prizes, real money prizes. All right, so maybe some of you have heard of GitHub. Others might have not heard about it, but this section is going to be all about GitHub. So first off, GitHub is a code hosting platform for version control and collaboration. So imagine you're given a project to do with a bunch of your colleagues. Well, if you put all your files, all your project files on GitHub, it's gonna let you collaborate with each other. We're gonna get into the details in terms of what all that means. In terms of version control, what we mean by this is that it allows you to actually keep track of the work and helps you see the changes that have been made, whether it's changes to data, coding scripts, notes, and so forth. So GitHub makes this super easy. Each of the files on GitHub has its own history. This makes it easy to explore the changes that occurred to it at different time points. You can also review other people's code, add comments to certain lines or the overall document, and suggest changes. GitHub also allows you to assign tasks to different users, making it clear who's responsible for which part of the analysis. You can also ask certain users to review your code. Now, much of these amazing features would be useless if it didn't allow you to keep track of your work and easily navigate among the many versions of the files you create, while of course also making sure that there's always a backup. To finish up this introduction on GitHub, I want you to go to github.com and I want you to sign up for a GitHub account. So just like I do it here, go to github.com. You're gonna see this amazing website. On the right hand side, it should be, there's a sign up, click on that. And pretty easy to create an account as you see, username, email address, password, make sure it's at least 15 characters or at least eight characters, including a number in a lowercase letter, email, prefer, uh, email preferences, and then verify your account. And down here, create account. You can of course also read the terms and all of that fun stuff. And with that, you will be ready 
to take part in this section. All right, my friends. So in this lecture, we're going to be creating what's called a repository. So a repository is simply a way to organize a single project. So think about each repository representing a single project. So repositories can have many different things inside of them. They can have folders and files, images, videos, spreadsheets, data sets, anything that your project might need. And it's also a good idea to have a readme file in there. It's simply a file that has information about your project. Now, go ahead and please log in if you haven't into GitHub. If you have, you should see a screen like this. And I just want you to go up here, right hand side, top right hand side, click on this icon and just do your repositories. Click on that. And you'll see that I have one repository. So it's this one right here called Dart Web Starter. And a couple of years back, I created a Dart programming course. So what I decided, and this is one of the most common things that people use GitHub for, is I have a whole bunch of files that students need access to when they're building this app with Dart. So what I did was I created a repository and I put all the files in there so they can come and download all those files. Okay, so if you, for example, click on this repository, you go in and then here where it says code, you can click on that. You can do a clone to get to it or you can do even download zip. I usually just do download zip and they'll have access to all those files. You click here to go inside. Okay. And if you click here web, these are the whole bunch of Dart files and some icons and other things that the students need access to uh, to make the app. So just wanted to show you that. But the point is we have all the files we need to create this app under one repository. So now what I want to do is I want us to create a new repository so you see how these things are created. So over here where it says new, we'll click on that. You see that it has my name here, ED8484, and then here it just requires a repository name. We're just going to call it hello world. Basically we can say it's going to be this very kind of general repository where we get to store ideas, resources, share and discuss things with other people. Okay. Next, we are going to, we can, if we choose anyways, to write a short description for it. So what it's about. So we can just say share ideas, resources with others. Okay. And then we can make it public or private. So we can say this is going to be private. And then we're going to add a readme. So this is always a very good idea. So it's just going to provide a readme file for this repository. And then we're going to do create repository. So once you do that, you should see this. As you see here, hello dash world. You see that it's private and you see that we have our readme file that we requested in there. And if you wanted to add more files, you could just go add file, upload files or create new file. And down here, you also see the name of our repository and you also see the description here. Next, in the next video, next lecture, I'm going to talk about branching. All right, so we're going to pick up where we left off. So we created our repository. Now it's time to talk about branching. And this is an important concept here. And branching is our way of working on different versions of a repository at one time. So if that's not clear, that's OK. We're just going to get right into it. And I'm going to show you an example. But if you look right over here, you see it says main. So this is our main branch. 
it's called main by default when we created the repository we actually had an option of naming our main branch by default it's called main so we just kept it and that's totally fine so the point of creating branches on top of this main branch is that it allows us to experiment and make edits before committing those changes to the main branch when you create a branch off that main branch you're making a copy or a snapshot of that main branch as it was at that point in time so let's say if somebody else made changes to the main branch while you were working on your branch you could pull in those updates and i'll have more to say about pulling later on in this section now i really like this diagram because it shows you very well this is called the github flow it shows you that there's a main branch or a master branch same thing and then when we make new iterations or new branches these are called feature branches because we're doing feature work on this branch feature meaning new work and the diagram shows you the journey that feature takes before it gets merged into the main or master branch a really good way to think about this is that your developers your designers and so forth are going to use the feature branches the offshoots if you will for keeping things like bug fixes and feature work separate from the main or master branch the main or master branch is your production branch so that's why when some change is ready you modify something you merge it into that main or master branch so now it is the time for us to actually go ahead and create a branch so you want to go to your repository hello world luckily we're already in there but suppose you weren't so you can go back up here you see you have uh, repositories um, there as well so here we have a popular repository we've got repositories here too and we can go to our hello world one okay and then we are going to click the drop down menu at the top of the file list that says branch main here and you see this drop down pop up here and then we have to type in a branch name so because we're doing some editing or changes to the readme file because that's the only file that we actually have in here remember I'm going to type in readme slash edits okay and then we're going to click on create branch or you can just go ahead and hit enter on your keyboard now let's take a look down here notice we have now our readme edits and it says here two branches perfect now i was thinking to do this next part in the next lecture but it's actually quite short so i'll do it right now we're going to be doing something called making and committing changes so we have the two branches we have the main and the readme edits branch so essentially what we have is we have a copy of main that is what readme edits is it's a copy of main so we can now do edits on github saved changes are called commits so whenever you make a change and you save it that's a commit and each commit has an associated commit message which is just a description explaining why a particular change was made i'll show you what i mean in just a second Commit messages, all they do is they simply capture the history of your changes so other contributors, remember the people that you're collaborating with, can understand what you've done and why. So what we're going to do is we're going to click on the readme.md file. Scroll down here. We're going to then click on right here, this pencil icon in the upper right corner of the file. 
This allows us to edit. And I'm just going to add here on this third line a little bit about me. I am the instructor for data science from scratch. Okay. We're now going to, at the bottom, we're going to write a commit message that describes the changes. So it already gave us here a title for the commit a description, update readme. So that's a pretty good name for it. Uh, so we'll just leave it at that update readme.md. Totally fine. And we can just say in the description, I add in some information about me. Okay. And you'll notice here this says commit directly to the readme edits branch. So that's we'll leave it at that and we'll just do commit changes. And we are done with that. So the next step is going to be a pull request. We're going to do that in the next lecture. See you soon. All right, folks, so it is time for us to do a pull request or open a pull request. So the first thing that you want to make sure, of course, is that you are on the readme edits branch. The whole point is that we have our main branch and we've created a readme edits off of that branch so we can make changes. And we did make changes to our readme file. Now that we have changes in a branch off of that main branch, the readme edits branch, we can open a pull request. To do that, you'll see pull requests right over here. You can click on that and then we want to go over to new pull requests. Now pull requests are the heart of collaboration on GitHub. When you open a pull request, you're proposing your changes and requesting that someone review and pull in your contribution and merge them into their branch. So pull requests show diffs or differences of the content from both branches. The changes, additions, and subtractions are shown in green and red. And as soon as you make a commit, you can open a pull request and start a discussion even before the code is finished. So remember that we did a commit before doing this pull request. In any case, we're going to go down here. And what you're going to need to do is where it says example comparison, you want to select the branch that you made or we made together, the readme edits to compare with the main, which is the original. Okay. So now we can look over the changes in the diffs or differences on the compare page. And you want to make sure that this is what you want to submit. So the part in green here is the part that was changed. And remember, in fact, this is exactly what we added. I'm the instructor for data science from scratch. So perfect. It knows the change that we made from the original because we have our main and then we created our readme edits and now we're comparing the two and it's telling us, hey, this was the part that was changed. And here you can actually as well see showing one changed file with one addition and zero deletion. So it even knows that we didn't take anything away from that. Amazing. So when you're happy with that and you want to submit these changes, you want to click the big green create pull request button right up here. The next thing that you want to do is you want to give your pull request a title. Okay, so here they put update readme dot 
MD. So that's sort of their suggestion. If you want to keep that, just keep it like that. And then give a little description about the change, right? So added a line about being the instructor for the course. And then you want to click on create pull request. And there we are. And it shows you your comment here. The final thing, do you remember what it is? If you remember the diagram that I showed you, where I showed you the main branch and then the feature going down and then eventually where did the feature end up? Right. The thing that we ended up doing is we ended up merging it. All the feature work that we did, we ended up merging it with the main branch. So that's exactly what we're going to do in this final step here. Merging our readme edits branch into the main branch. So you see this big green button here, merge pull request. You just want to click on that and it's going to merge that into main. And then all you want to do is click confirm merge. And then the final thing that you want to do is since the changes have now been incorporated into that main branch, we can delete the branch in the purple box here. So you're all set. And it even tells you the readme edits branch can be safely deleted. So once it's merged, you can actually get rid of that branch. So delete branch. The final thing I would mention is that GitHub has something called the mention system, similar to Twitter, where you can use that at sign in your pull request message. So let's say you need feedback from specific people or teams and you know it doesn't matter where they are if they're down the hall or somewhere in another country if you use the at symbol in your pull request message you can talk to other people that you're working with and ask for clarification or anything that you want in that pull request message so that does it